Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because you bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. So I brought something with me this morning. I know it's going to be a little bit hard for you all to see. But um, this is my honest-to-goodness pastor card. And on it, it says that uh, the certifies that the Reverend Christine L. Steffen, because I haven't had it changed since I was married, so it says, the Reverend Christine L. Steffen is an ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and it's Washington... Metropolitan Washington, D.C. Synod. It's a pretty pretty cool card. Um, it says that I am an official licensed registered card carrying member of the Jesus Club. <laughs> and it's all signed by the bishop and everything. I mean, it's very, very special. I was thinking that I could ask all of you if you had such a special card, but then I knew that Pastor Steve would ruin the whole image. And he'd be like, well, I have a Jesus card. It's the biggest looking idea I have in my life. <laughs> Now, it doesn't really right say that I'm a member of the Jesus Club. I am, and you all are, but you don't actually need an a, a official license that says that. But, um, the, you know, I'm not really sure, so like Pastor Steve alludes to, I'm not really sure um, what the purpose of the Jesus card is. Um, you know, this, this card, what privileges it entitles me to. The only times I've ever, ever used the card is to prove that I am actually a pastor. So this is sort of how it goes usually. You know, I'll be in a group of folks and um, usually people that I know and then some people that I don't know. And you all have been in conversations like this, right? So you know that eventually in this mixed company, you know, things turn to, oh, so what do you do for work, right? Well, I have had this conversation enough and I can predict with a fair amount of certainty how it's going to go. As soon as I say, I'm a pastor, everybody starts thinking, wow, what did I say about five minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's this blank stare, and they look at me, and they're like, really? And so if one of my good friends is there, typically they'll say something like, well, show them your pastor card, and I usually do because it lightens the mood, it sort of breaks that total awkwardness by admitting I'm a pastor, and provides a little bit of comic relief because, yeah, they actually issue us pastor cards. However, I feel that this is not the intended purpose that the bishop has behind the pastor card. I think that the purpose, if there is any, is to prove that I'm a pastor when I'm visiting hospitals or something. And it also issues me an ID number that they use down at the synod offices for administrative purposes. It also has an expiration date on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as long as it falls within that expiration date, it says that it declares that I am under call. Because if one has not served a church for a period of time, they can eventually forfeit their ordination unless the Council of Bishop, Bishops um, you know, decides to extend that person's leave from call. Well, mine expires this year, by the way, and so I'm fairly hopeful that the bishop will renew mine. I think we're pretty, pretty safe, pretty safe there. Um, but regardless, those are the only reasons I've ever been able, 
ever been able to come up with for needing a pastor card. However, while all of that's true, that the physical pastor card doesn't really get me anything, it's also true that without everything that lies behind it, without the education and the panel approvals and the internships and all the promises, well then I really have nothing. No claim on pastorship, no speciality, no identity. I would basically be an undocumented worker. So the card, it really does entitle me to something within today's confines of societal structures, religious structures, and political structures. I think Jesus would look at my pastor card and roll his highs, though, and sort of say, so? That really means nothing to me, the kingdom of God. Because this is exactly what happens when John starts complaining about these horrible, undocumented workers who are out there casting out demons. Jesus is very quick to tell him that it's not his place to call dibs on righteousness or faithfulness or to check papers to ensure people are registered members of the Jesus Club. John just can't seem to fathom letting people just go around willy-nilly doing good things. I mean, they have no right to just do good things when they're not following Jesus. This was the issue for John and the disciples. Undocumented workers were taking their work. But those that sort of had the right paperwork were missing Jesus' point. See, apparently the early church wasn't all united in their beliefs. Sometimes they clashed with one another, and occasionally the churches even berated one another over practice, which seems to sound fairly familiar in today's day and age also. See, just the other evening, I was in D.C., and I was walking down Half Street towards National Stadium. And it was, so it was last week, right? And if you follow baseball, you know that the Nats were playing the Orioles, so it was a very, very packed environment. And then in the middle of everything, I saw someone, and you should remember those words, they're sort of important in today's reading. I saw someone who was carrying a giant black billboard, and it said on it, the Pope is the Antichrist. This is Tuesday, <laughs> the day before the Pope was here, right? The Pope is the Antichrist, and it also said, um, repent and be born again or burn in hell. And he was spewing bastardizations of the gospel through his megaphone. It was really hard to miss him and really hard to ignore. So I turn to my husband and I say to him, see, this is what people think of Christianity. This is everything that's wrong with the church. And so he sort of looks at me with this little like twinkle in his eye. I think he really would have loved if I took him up on this. But he says, so you want to go take him on? Oh, no, I was not in the mood for a fight. But I do clearly have an issue with the way he's going about sort of bringing people to Jesus. Unlike the man in our gospel story who isn't documented, this guy, this guy downtown, he is a documented worker, right? He goes to church, he knows his Bible, and he's doing work for the kingdom of God. And my reaction to that is, well, God help us all then. Although it's probably a matter of perspective. If you asked him, I'm confident that he would say he most certainly is a committed follower of Christ. Now, since I didn't have a conversation with him, I'm sort of guessing. But I'm pretty sure his mode of operation as a disciple is to save souls for heaven. And he's given it his very best shot. If you ask me, also a card-carrying member of the Jesus Club, I would say he's not for the kingdom, but he's against it, despite the fact that he's making decrees in Jesus' name. Regardless, I have the distinct feeling that my finger wagging won't get me very far with Jesus, especially since he suggests it would be better for me to slice my finger off in the Cuisinart as I'm making my next dinner for the church potluck, rather than focusing on rightness or wrongness of the ball field evangelist. So I guess it's a good thing that I didn't take him on, because I'd probably be down a tongue also for the verbal lashing I would have given him, and I would be wearing an eye patch, eye patch this morning um, for the nasty glares that I really, really wanted to give to him. 
And Jesus would sort of shake his head at me, and he would say, for God's sake. I was kidding about the whole maiming thing, get over yourself. You're making the kingdom of heaven much harder than it actually is. See, Jesus doesn't seem to care if we're documented or undocumented, which we can construe in many, many different ways. You know, are they the people that attend church or don't attend church? Are they the baptized or the unbaptized? Are they the Lutherans or the Jews? Are they the Americans or the foreigners? The list of the ways that we divide ourselves is innumerable. But Jesus boils it down to this. Do you love well? And do you enact peace? Do you stand for equity? Because that is kingdom. The disciples thought they knew better, that they had better knowledge, and in some ways that they had a better handle on Jesus. However, their jealousy and their elitism sort of makes them sound like six-year-olds tattling to their mom. You know, we saw someone just like I saw someone. And Jesus puts them in their place. Arrogant religious sophistication has no place in Jesus' kingdom. Jesus has a problem with sides. At least he has a problem with us picking sides, creating them and defending them. We get so caught up in our being right that sometimes we miss the inbreaking of the kingdom before our very eyes. Jesus teaches that love is the paramount expression of authority, which is totally different than how we think of authority. Authority in our minds is sort of linked to status and power and knowledge, all of which allow us to exercise judgment and punishment on those that we deem lower, weaker, and frankly, dumber. I mean, all you have to do is think about the ways I wanted to act as an authoritarian voice based on my knowledge to realize my desire to demean the ball field evangelist was basically a, mean of a means of judgment and punishment. I wanted to sort of illegitimize his citizenship in the kingdom of God. And then there's the disciples who want to punish the guy who's doing work. And he's not even licensed to do that work, despite the fact that he's enacting goodness. And there's a young man in our Old Testament reading who's complaining about Eldad and Medad who are prophesying in the camp, and they weren't supposed to do it that way. I mean, we've all felt like this. We've all had those feelings where we meet somebody that we completely disagree with, either religiously or politi politically, or there's a divide on how we proceed at work, or a disagreement within your family, or we think that we have the right to do some something and somebody else does not. And the authoritarian in us comes out. But what's so difficult about all of these scenarios is typically in disagreements, they don't arise because people don't care. They arise because people care so much. Like in my example, I was upset because faith and church and God are so important to me that I was convinced that the sign he displayed and the message he was proclaiming was doing damage to the kingdom rather than building up faith and sharing love. And I actually still think that, that that's still how I feel about that scenario. But there's no denying that the ball field evangelist cares, too, quite a lot. I mean, I have never gone down to that stadium and found, held up a giant sign you know, to declare my love for Jesus. I have never done that. But it's not my job to put a stumbling block in this man's way. It is my job to love him. It's my job to be a worker with him in the kingdom of God. A kingdom in which we are all beloved citizens. The only way that I can replace my pension for I saw someone is with my faith's message of I see Jesus. Even in someone with whom I disagree, I see Jesus. Even in the politician that I despise and I want to ridicule for his newest asinine remark, I see Jesus. Or in the co-worker who opposes every new idea we have or whose actions aren't those that we would take, I see Jesus. And even in the loud, screaming, held up, come up preacher man at the ball field, I see Jesus. No matter the sign he carries. The only way to stop the abuse on the authority of love is for us to stop abusing others, not only in word and deed, but also in thought. 
We must stop crucifying love. You know, um, the greatest sign that was ever erected, we tore it down. And that sign was the cross. And on it hung the only man who did know the fullness of right and wrong. And he allowed himself to be made wrong. He gave up the right to be right. He gave up the right to be loved. He gave up the right to be justified, the right to be accepted, so that we might know that he would give up everything for us. On the cross, Jesus becomes wrong, so that we can be right. Not in knowledge, but so that we might know how right love can make us. And the enormity of that type of love and acceptance, I mean, that type of love should bring us to our knees. The sign of the cross is not about how much blood was spilled, not about who did the corrupt crucifying, not about religious affiliation, not proper worship, not strict or loose biblical interpretation, and most certainly not about what card you carry. The sign of the cross comes down to this. We are saved through love alone, by love alone, and for love alone. And that's everything. That's everything to 